is not working. Good evening. I'll just take a few minutes to introduce Matt, who's our speaker today. Uh, Matt is doing his PhD in Human Geography and Urban Studies at uh, the London School of Economics. And he has experience uh, in a number of research projects in South Asia as well as different parts of Africa. He, for his PhD, he looks at uh, urban infrastructure and governance in Indian cities with a focus on water supply in southern Delhi. And apart from that, he's worked on projects around migration and urbanization across five countries in South Asia, and also looked at relocation outcomes in urban areas in southern Africa and South Asia. And now I'd like to call Ma um, Matt to start his talk. And sorry, I'm just I'm just thinking where to start. Um, do you, is any, is anyone kind of familiar with Delhi in the room? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, the other thing is that I don't know so much about Bangalore or other cities. So if people have like experience of, of other places, it would be great to hear some of that uh, later on and kind of get your your input. Um, so I've been living in Delhi for about 18 months, uh, trying to do field work on, on water situation, talking to residents. Um, <coughs> sorry, politicians, politicians water, water suppliers, uh, private, private, private sector people, people and uh, to a lesser extent the, the public utility. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how like, access to water is, is structured in the city, particularly areas which have unreliable public supply. So unauthorized and planned areas. Um, is it it's too loud? loud? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's not loud enough, really. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Um, so yeah. So one thing I'm trying to figure out is how people get access to water, especially when the public supply is limited. And uh, the other thing is to look at how like in initiatives, projects to improve the situation, how they are, how they're getting on in that environment. Um, so I focused on South Delhi for a number of reasons, but before I get into that, we, I'm going to sort of take us out to the bigger picture, um, which is this. Uh, this is a, it's like a map. Um, it's a map of post-monsoon groundwater recharge um, in India. It's, uh, it's not so bad southern India, but you can see there's a uh, big red spot. That means it's, un, uh, it's not really being recharged after the monsoon. Um, so what's going on there? The, um, the World Bank is saying, well, um, India is the world's largest extractor of groundwater. And uh, aquifers in North India are being extracted, uh, depleted, the second fastest rate in the world after Syria. Uh, groundwater is now India's main water source uh, across all uses, industrial, agriculture, um, and urban, oh, that's a different thing. Um, this, is, this is quite a recent phenomenon, sort of post uh, the Green Revolution in the 1970s, uh, when tube wells came in, uh, use has been rising. Uh, just looking at drinking water, 85% of drinking water in India is, is groundwater now. Um, but the, the way that groundwater feeds into kind of urban domestic water use is not really, it's not really well understood, it's not really well studied so far. Um, just again on that depletion story, the, the bank is saying that they, a majority, 60% of Indian aquifers are likely to be critically uh, depleted in the next 20 years. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of looming issue. Um, on the, the data, it's kind of patchy so far. There's a, a number of different estimates. Uh, Center for Science Environment in, uh, the, what's it called, Excreta Matters, they, they reckon that groundwater is about 48% of urban water across 71 major cities. Um, Institute of Urban Affairs, say 56% of metropolitan class one, class two cities are groundwater dependent. And uh, the groundwater board says that unaccounted for groundwater in urban areas is over 50% in 28 Indian cities. That's um, 
that's about as good as the data gets at that kind of scale. Uh, there's a really nice paper by Mihir Shah uh, with ICREA that came out just earlier this year. So uh, I can give you the reference for that if you want to follow that up. Um, so there's a second, second sort of part of the story here. And that would be that, like, you, d you, you can't hear me, no? Closer. OK, sorry. Um, so the second part of the story is that urbanization in India from the, the 2011 census uh, is, is growing massively in, uh, in these census towns, these smaller towns, medium cities. It's not just the metro cities. Um, <clears throat> and these census towns, which are not like, officially recognized as urban areas, account for nearly 30% of urban growth uh, over the last decade. And four out of five of these are not near. Some of them are peripheral to major cities, but four out of five of them are not. So they're going to have... Uh, they're going to have water problems of a, of a kind. Um, so to explain this, the, the pattern of water use, it varies with the settlement size. Um, and as you can see, and this, again, this is from Mihir Shah, Shah's work, um, cities don't really get the kind of political financial clout to access surface water till they hit about 5 million people plus, till they really start to become quite large. Uh, so with this uh, pattern of urbanization happening in smaller cities and peripheries of cities, that's mainly going to be using groundwater. Uh, okay, so uh, why am I looking at Delhi? In that case, there's, there's some resonance with that larger picture. Um, groundwater use in Delhi, particularly the peri-urban uh, and unplanned, unplanned areas, is extensive. Um, it's not very well regulated, and these neighborhoods are often reliant on groundwater, both from like formal public sources and other other sources. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, you can see in the, you can see in the map there that uh, particularly in the south of the city, groundwater levels are falling particularly fast. Um, last ten years, is 150 feet or so, something like that. Um, and so that's where that's where my research primary research areas are. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, just again, like to take it back a minute. Why is Delhi even using groundwater? It's a it's a major city. Uh, it's one of India's largest, most politically powerful cities. And you can see here, like the Delhi's water network extends hundreds of kilometers outside the city. So there's something of a puzzle as to you know why this use is even happening. Um, and there's there's a s frequent discourse in Delhi that the city doesn't have enough water, which is. Uh, which is also slightly strange. Um, so you can see here that one of the, one of the things that's going on there is uh, that actually the water distribution in the city is massively unequal. Um, again, in addition to that inequality, the efficiency of the network um, is pretty poorly ranked among, amongst Indian metros. It comes next to Kanpur. I think it's the kind of, uh, does the worst out of, out of major cities. Um, you can see on the map there's a big discrepancy between the kind of central areas and particularly the more the more edge areas. And so I think what's going on here is that as population growth has grown on the edges of the city, the public network hasn't hasn't kept up with that. Um, so about 50% of the population don't get uh, access to reliable water. That's a 2000 study. Um, and for those that do, it's, it's probably the same in Bangalore, right? The water access is rotating. So if you're lucky, it comes a couple of hours a day. Um, okay. So, yeah, Delhi's, uh, Delhi's a big city, obviously. Um, about 75% of the population actually gets uh, piped water, public water. The uh, CAG, Comptroller Auditor General, uh, report 2009 is saying about 25% of the population are purely dependent on water tankers. Um, and so part of this, again, as, as I mentioned, is just due to the fast growth in the city. Delhi is growing uh, faster than many other metros. Um, and about 70% of the population are living in these unplanned areas, uh, like this one, which is where I live. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that's happening there is that the, the, amount, the, the amount of water, the way that water is supplied, and the quality of the water are also dependent on the planning status of the neighborhood. There's a kind of official... Uh, you may know there's a sort of official list of seven types of uh, residential area and they get different graded uh, water supply according to that. <coughs> so planning status is a big deal. Um, and this is within the, just on that last slide, you can see, 
this what was it new and south delhi is apparently getting 148 liters per person per day which is kind of who standard for water supply um <clears throat> but then if you actually go to like within that scale uh, on this map you can see these red areas which are unregistered connections so they haven't been able to get connections formally from the public network they've taken them anyway and if you uh, know the area these do they correspond very precisely to the uh, to the unplanned areas within the within the zone uh, okay <coughs> so the this this 25 percent of the city that doesn't get pipe water it's it's mo you can't see this very well it's more likely in the parts of south delhi that look like this um less likely these areas although there is uh, some some aspect of that uh without the okay so households without a uh, decent water supply are depending on illegal connections bore wells uh tankers to to get water that's not always safe uh, it's usually more expensive or you just can't get it uh, so obviously this has like negative effects on health uh, education like if girls have to stay back from school to wait for water tankers people might have to miss work or be late for work because they're waiting for water things like that um Again, coming back to the groundwater story, most of this informal water that's coming through tankers, coming through small-scale private suppliers or self-supply is, is groundwater. That's part of the groundwater problem. <coughs> okay, so that's, uh, that's a kind of broad overview, background to my research. Uh, within this situation, there, there are two things happening. There's a set of reforms that are kind of coming through, driven by international financial actors um, to bring in the private sector to the water system to make it financially viable, more efficient. That's one thing that's happening. Then on top of that is another layer of reforms that's been brought in after the Arm Admi Party came in. Was that last year? Two years ago? You know, they came in, they went out, they came back again. Um, so they're also changing this. As you probably know Kedru was a water campaigner before he, was a, before he became a politician. So there's this, this whole layer of things that's coming in on top. Um, <coughs> Okay, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk about this now. Uh, this is the academic background uh, to to work on water. Uh, most of it is there's a lot from Mumbai, Bangalore, um, Chennai. I think I think we can add to this. Looking at Delhi, the situation is slightly different, uh, but I'm not. I'm not gonna get into it. The names are just there. Some people find them useful. Um, okay, so how's water supply? How's water supply structured in uh, in unplanned areas in South Delhi? Um, as I mentioned, the public network is uh, is pretty. Uh, it's limited, there are limitations to it, in addition to the inequality that I mentioned in distribution. Um, low pressure is a, is a big issue. Uh, you probably know if there's low pressure in the pipes, this allows ingress to come in from the outside. So if sewage pipes, water pipes are next to each other, you, get, you end up getting sewage uh, coming into the water. The second thing I already mentioned is this intermittent supply. So supply hours, the water comes in goes off again. Uh, that's, that's a problem because you can't automate, you, again, you probably know, you can't automate water pumps. You've got to turn them on manually. So if your water comes at four in the morning, you've got to wake up at four in the morning every day to turn the water on or you don't have any water. Uh, the second part of this intermittent supply is it's very bad for the pipes. So you're already getting ingress where the pipes are old. Then when you have this water coming in at high pressure hitting the pipes, it tends to crack them. So then you get more uh, outside substances coming into the pipes so this you know there's a general distrust of uh, piped water supply in delhi and then there's also concern around industrial pollution heavy metals things like that they, in addition to that in some areas uh, particularly unplanned areas uh, tube well water is mixed up in the pipes sometimes it's in a parallel network people don't always know and then that's just straight up untreated groundwater that is hard to distinguish apart from the taste um, okay, so that's, that's going on with the public network. Um, because of that, there's a number of ways that people have supplemented the system. Uh, you can, yeah, actually you can't see very well. Uh, these, are, these are small pumps, so they're probably legal. There's a, you, I think you're allowed up to one horsepower beyond the meter is legal. So pumping obviously is, is very common because the pressure's bad. Um, okay, we've got that. Um, the, the pipes are plastic, so th this is an unauthorized area. Plastic pipes don't comply with jail board code, so the Delhi jail board can't do anything to this network. They shouldn't really, it kind of shouldn't exist for them. So that, that starts to create problems, particularly if you want to upgrade the network. Um, the other main way that people supplement supplies through storage, uh, tanks on the roofs, or like in, if people have less space, they give over living space to storing water. Um, just on that ingress, again, there's some kind of pictures. This was an MCD study. A uh, couple of years back, um, 
talking about the uh, potability of Delhi's water, the, the Jawa board um, characteristically kind of refused to acknowledge this survey. They have their own methods. Um, okay, so how are these how are these relationships to water structured in unplanned areas? Um, the sort of on a personal level, you've got a lot. Of these, you know, there's a lot of kind of uncertainty, uh, anxiety. Uh, kind of waiting for water, that's another thing. You just often hear, hear people say, like, oh, the water's come, the water's come. Um, cost is higher. I mentioned that. Technology is a kind of common intermediary. The other thing that happens a lot is this kind of personal mediation story. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, <coughs> broadly, we can say that, like, water infrastructures in these areas are they're kind of like open systems. They're unstable. They're, they're kind of changing all the time. People are patching them up all the time. Um, and you can see in this picture there actually you know what that's let me let me pause i'm going to come back to that for a minute but they're they're open systems both physically uh in terms of like the material network and also administratively in terms of who's got the power to modify uh change or action activate that system so within that that's where this picture comes in the the relationships to water are not just it's not just like a black box technical thing uh, there's also these, these quite kind of strong material determinants of how water supply happens or doesn't happen. Uh, so, you know, what I mean by that is these kind of fixed things, like the distance from the sources. That's part of the reason South Delhi gets uh, bad supplies, because it's a long way from the main water plants. Or like on a more neighborhood level, if you're far from the zonal inlets where the water comes into your area, you're going to get lower pressure, you get worse supply. On like a street level, if the, if the dew well is down the other end of the street, you're going to get worse, worse supply. There's all these kind of things that make the network very patchy and uneven. <sighs> uh, second, things like that, again, urban form plays a role, density of areas, that's going to be an issue. And just physical stuff, like the, the height of the area, the slope of the area, the soil type, that's going to affect your groundwater recharge. All these things make it a lot more complicated than... Uh, if you're coming from an engineering background, particularly European engineers, they're not used to systems like this. It's very complicated for them. So that's what's happening here. Is this is the the main road in this area is uh, at a lower height than the rest of the surrounding areas. Uh, there's no sewers, so there's definitely no stormwater drains. So after it rains, this whole street just floods with sewage, and that the houses are sometimes like five foot below ground. So again, the houses are, are going to flood when that happens. Um, so what is quite a live issue in uh, at times like that so okay again this is the same area kind of the edge of the area uh, the, pu the public supply in these areas is it's not great it's pretty blurry even who's got responsibility for it is it the water board is it the MLAs can the councillors do something um, knowledge of the network is not good even in quite formalized areas uh, let alone, thank you, informal areas. And these, these issues are compounded sometimes by kind of rent-seeking or political calculation. Uh, so w one of the things that I'm thinking is that this kind of minimal provision, uh, which in unauthorized areas with no pipe supply mainly takes the form of tube wells and tankers, this, uh, this kind of provision allows representatives a greater discretionary role. Um, and the costs of the, the pipe water that would usually come through the network are kind of deferred and they're passed on to consumers that will need to rely on stuff like you know, canned water, bottled water, private tankers, uh, things like that. Uh, so just going to talk a little bit more about that. And again, I expect it's the same in Bangalore. I, I don't know. I'd, I'd love to find out. Um, so tankers kind of allow this role for this role of intercession. Um, Sorry. Uh, yes. So there also, there seems to be this kind of informal split between there are like what they call point tankers that come to a regular fixed spot on a. The schedules have recently been put up on the Jailboard website, made public. Uh, so there are these point tankers, and then there are emergency tankers. And it seems to be that the MLAs kind of have control of the emergency tankers. That's seen as their part of the system, and the Jailboard retains control of the fixed tankers. People really want the fixed tankers. The emergencies are just a stopgap. You get one once, then you know, next time you need water, you have to go back to the office and uh, get the MLA to, to sort it out for you again. So this uh, creates this kind of quite personalized uh, working environment where these, uh, there's, you know, there's a number of people that you could approach if you've got a water problem. And depending on kind of you know, physical location, political affiliation, previous contact, etc., things like this, you, you could choose any one of these people to try and get your water to arrive. Um, you know, and again, within that various, you know, different actors have different degrees of discretion, uh, different amounts of flexibility, perhaps. 
Uh, in one area, the, the MLA kind of has a full-time staff, no, a couple of areas, full-time staff member purely devoted to dealing with tankers or like tanker-related complaints of tankers not arriving. So it's, it's quite a big part of their work. Um, okay, so that's one of these discretionary things. The, the second way that water comes into unsupplied areas uh, is through tube wells. And again, you've got this kind of discretionary role. You've got to, people have to petition the MLA to get a tube well in. They're never happy with the amount of tube well water. They always want more tube wells. The particular siting of that thing is, a, again, a kind of contested area. <coughs> And what, ha what often happens with these in, in your more peripheral kind of neighborhoods is they often get captured by kind of locally influential people. Um, quite often that seems to be the Pradans in a neighborhood, whether they're elected, how they get the position, I don't know. Um, they might run that themselves, or more likely they depute someone to run it. They'd be called a Kono Wola, and they turn the valves on to give the water to different areas. Uh, they get paid for that, they get a fee. They would say we're jailboard employees, uh, but I don't think that's a formal arrangement. And the amount of money that they take, that, that kind of varies also. Um, there's, yeah, okay, there's more to say about that actually in a minute. Just the, whew, the first thing would be that as the, as the groundwater levels decline, tube wells uh, run out, they become extinct, or the water becomes increasingly gritty, increasingly hard. Uh, so there just, just ends up not being not enough, and sometimes these colony wallers are kind of trapped in like, people start complaining, you're not giving us water, you're being late, you're being lazy, whereas actually it's just a physical, like, the supply is getting depleted. Um, okay, so with this, with this kind of system, when the ARP came to power the first time, in, uh, in one side of one of my research sites, they managed to renationalize some of these bore wells that they said uh, were captured by the, the water mafia. Uh, they they renationalized about 35 of plus minus 160 public bore wells and 200 odd private uh, in, in the areas that they could. Um, although I don't think that lasted very long. And um, <coughs> this bore well we're looking at, it was renationalized, uh, but it's gone back under the control of an opposition party worker who actually this last pipe in the end, that's a private house. Each other one of these feeds a whole gully, a whole lane, but this uh, last pipe just feeds that guy's um, individual house. So this kind of public, what's public, what's private, is quite blurry and it's, it's open to, uh, it's definitely open to intervention. Uh, okay, also the prices, the prices would be quite high. Like if people are selling this water, mm, people say six, seven hundred rupees a month to get uh, tube well water that may becomes, you know, once a month, once in six weeks, something like this. It's not a great supply. It's not going to be a sufficient supply. But that's why people are ordering tankers. And the other thing that they'll be doing is using uh, private supply, private sector water, like bottled water. Um, so this has kind of come up a lot over about the, about the last 10 years or so. I think partly, and you could probably tell me better, partly this is attributed to kind of growing awareness of health risks, uh, probably a bit of rising incomes, and also people just say the public water has actually got worse. Um, and, and again, the groundwater is becoming uh, more and more scarce. <coughs> so uh, this kind of thing is very common. Uh, these, these sort of jars, you probably recognize them, they go for, I don't know, maybe 30 rupees up to 100 if you want like bisleri or something very premium. Um, people would usually use this if they don't have a RO filter or any other kind of expensive filter in their house. Um, larger households, they might drink two, three, they might use two or three jars of these a day. So on a month, that might work out about 2,000 rupees, something. It becomes appreciable, especially if you're then paying for a tube or network, you're then paying for tanker water. Uh, the price can be a lot. It seems to be quite a, um, how do you say, accessible source of employment in, uh, in kind of more marginalized areas. People seem to go into business fairly easily with this, this kind of thing. Uh, water's usually coming in from factories further outside of the city, kind of southwest, Badapur, Okla, uh, Ghaziabad or so, and then you might have within the neighborhoods, they'll be kind of much smaller scale, much less um, formal, much less legal factories, uh, like this kind of thing. Uh, so this is like a private RO plant. You can buy these from Tata, it's okay. Uh, this is running on the top floor of a kind of uh, underused building in, in one of these areas. Uh, the guy that owns it, he's got about four tankers that kind of wait for orders and we use this water and then he has six guys that will go out on bikes <coughs> like, like that and take, uh, take water to shops. Um, one of the interesting things for me here is that he's saying this is a kind of side business. It's not my main concern. My main business is real estate, but this is just something I do to make uh, extra money and he does it. I think he makes quite good money from it. 
Um, and again, other kind of tanker owners that I've spoken to, they say similar things, like this is just one of a number of livelihood strategies, it's not a main thing. Uh, they might run security firms or have auto rickshaws, uh, companies that is, or, or do real estate again. So they're not, they don't tend to, they're like, okay, you know, it's okay if the government comes in, they shut it, they try and make it illegal again, that's, that's all right, we do, we do another business. Generally, these seem, these seem to be quite small concerns. People might have one, two, maybe four or five tankers, not, uh, not much more than that. Um, the work gets busy in the summers, people might even they'll work two shifts, day and night, solid, uh, the drivers that is. And tankers, I don't know what the prices are here, they go for about you know, maybe 800 rupees up to one and a half thousand, depending on the neighborhood, depending on time of year. Uh, the water, sometimes they say, oh, we just get it out of the river, or we get it from near the river. Uh, sometimes it comes in from Haryana over the border, Badapur. Uh, sometimes it comes from tube wells, public, private. Uh, okay, yeah, so these are, these are kind of fairly small scale businesses, and they're, they're fairly competitive. You know, there's, I don't think there's kind of major tensions between operators. Um, and probably not any more collusion than there would be in another industry. Um, you've also got this kind of side of thing, which is quite different. This is, uh, that, that other tanker was uh, like 4,000 litres. This one is 30,000 litres. Uh, this is one of Delhi's more expensive malls. Uh, these tankers come all the time to the mall. When they're not filling up, they're kind of parked behind the mall. Uh, in just one hour, like last, last month, I saw 12 of these tankers filling up, like just non-stop filling up. Um, drivers say the water's from Haryana. People tell me that you couldn't get water from Haryana close enough to make this economically viable legally. It's also going to be in a kind of groundwater black spot. Uh, okay, so that's the that's kind of different side of things. <coughs> so, uh, what's happening with the, with the situation when the Arm Admi Party come in? Uh, this is one of the things they kind of, I mean, it was, you know, it was before under Sheila Dixit too, but especially with AAP, you know, they were campaigning on basic water. Uh, it was a big part of the campaign and it was a big part of what people were looking for. Um, just not really worth reading about that. Mentioned that. Okay. There is this sort of issue with, it's kind of blurry, obviously. Sometimes, uh, public Delhi Jalbo tankers will get diverted and they'll just, the water will just get sold off and maybe that water will get refilled from a... Uh, private tube well and then delivered maybe it won't that's you know they just usually they don't turn up that's why the MLA has a member of staff that every day deals with complaints for tankers not turning up uh, one of the things the ARP's done on this you, you might have heard they put GIS so they've started to uh, get water tankers equipped with GIS so that you can track them this was this was there before um, under there's a parastatal that does this stuff for Delhi government it was there before, but the, the issues before, apart from the data being patchy, were that even, it's quite obvious that tankers have gone way off course to some other place. But the, the regulation of that data was not, it's not with the DJB because of this kind of fragmentation of governance where you've got the, the people doing the filling, the consumers, the company actually who's got the data, and then the jail board that's supposed to be monitoring it, it's kind of you know, mixed up and there wasn't really anyone that was uh, able to enforce that. Again, Previously, Jailboard was renting, the hired tankers were from three major companies. So it was, I think it would be difficult to enforce that. Um, you know, it would be up for negotiation when the contracts were renewed, whenever they were. You know, the drivers are not Jailboard employees. They're employed by these other large companies. Um, so having said that, that was previous situation. Now that ARP's coming in, this, this data is public, it's online. You can, uh, I don't know how well it works, but you can go to the website, you can look and you can see, okay, my tanker is, is there today. Um, so that's... That's a big thing that they're doing. Uh, they, I mean, it's still, you know, obviously it's not working perfectly. Um, it's, it's early days. Uh, the, the second major thing that ARP's been doing is uh, connecting up areas that weren't there previously. So uh, those of you, that it's actually it's not a very good shot anyway, but this is just a sign that says, like, your MLA has got water supply put into this area. It's uh, Sonia Vihar. Sonia Vihar was the, the private... Um, private sector built water treatment plant that's come in, everyone, everyone's very aware of it. They're like, we want Sonia Vihar water, we want clean water. So this is, we're bringing you Sonia Vihar water and the, the ARP MLA has done this for you. Um, <coughs> so there's, there's that thing happening. There's this free lifeline water. You might have heard about this, this kind of subsidy idea. Um, that's come in, but that's only for people on connections, metered connections. Uh, if, you d if you don't have BPL subsidy or some other thing like that, it's, it's good. Uh, it does definitely save money. Uh, again, that was a previously existing idea. It was kind of floated in 2004, 2005. So it's part of this kind of fluid 
policy environment that they've kind of picked up on some some things that are, are good. Um, this area, both the MLAs in this uh, this area are on the Delhi Double Board, so they have kind of more clout to be able to get this kind of stuff done. I mean, again, there's this kind of competitive claiming for the who's been able to get this work done. People in the area will say, well, you know, the MP, this is a BJP MP, he's been trying to get water supply for 10 years. So that's, I think that's part of where the signs come in. But to be fair, since the op came in, this area's got connected and it's, you know, like 30 years old. It hasn't had water for 30 years. Um, so I think, I think they're doing that. Uh, Having said that, again, there are, there are two MLAs in this area. It's different on different sides, depending on this kind of personalized stuff, this MLA's individual strength, who he's got working for him, what their backgrounds were, how well connected perhaps they are. Um, and so on the one side, they're bringing in this, this pipe water quite extensively. On the other, much less so. And um, this guy was saying the first time around, it was really hard. Like, I didn't have the... There was so much unspent funds from the MLA before. He didn't spend any of the... They, they, part of the MLA funds is, like, they have to spend it on water. It's, like, uh, mandatory that a quarter of it goes to the jail board. Uh, none of that was spent. He, he said, I managed to get a few tube wells in, but I didn't have the strength on the ground to control them or to be able to get the jail board to do, to do more work for me. So it's still kind of quite variable. Um... <coughs> More, more on the up. Uh, okay, so this is the, the, that previous picture of, of connecting up unsaid areas, that's, that's more about these unplanned, unauthorized colonies, really what that applies to. With um, JJ clusters and slums, looked very good in the white paper on the water policy. Um, the thinking seems to be moving towards these water ATMs, which is a different kind of model. It's been quite tricky where they've tried it till now in Delhi. It hasn't had particularly good take up. Uh, because people get free water from tankers, so they're not, uh, apart from other issues with the machines, which I won't go into, they're going to need to stop the tanker service or something if they want that to, uh, to, to run. Uh, but again, it's, you know, it's part of this kind of fluid policy environment that these ideas come in, they get tried out. Um, so, like I was saying, this is again, this is kind of claiming credit for some work that's been done in the area. Um, actually, the, the strange thing about this, uh, this one is on the other side of the street, you can't see it, um, there's also work being done under the PPP in the area. So it's kind of like the MLA's seen that, he wants to be able to, you know, to show that he's also keeping up for some administrative reason. That area is not under the PPP, so he's, he's got the pipes relayed in that street uh, to kind of get, get credit for it. And again, in the, you know, this previous, previous site, both the, both the MLAs have been quite involved in agitations against the jail board, donors against the jail board when they were in opposition. And now that they're in power, they, ha you know, they have the same thing from opposition parties uh, coming to them. And so, ag again, the PPP people would say, well, you know, this is a classic thing. The MLAs always use water as a way to kind of stir people up. It's something they can always uh, complain about or take credit for, um, alternatively. <coughs> so this is, um, this is now this is moving to this area where the uh, public-private partnership is taking place to bring the private sector in. Uh, the idea here basically is that by increasing the efficiency of the network, uh, you can supply more people and you can still have kind of resources left over to, to turn a profit. It's quite tightly controlled. Pr prices are controlled by the Delhi Jail Board, so the private operator can't raise prices. The Jail Board's already doing that to make it uh, more viable. Um, okay, we've got that, yeah. Now, the area is quite mixed, so I think it is kind of a test. There are these at least three areas where PPPs are taking place. There are other areas where these kind of reforms are happening. Um, and I think they're just really experimenting to see uh, how to make improvements. Uh, one of the things with this project was that the, the foreign company was very keen to go 24-7 water. That's the kind of buzzword. Um, <coughs> very far from the existing system, which is a couple of hours a day. Uh, and that was a kind of experience that they brought with them from overseas and they, they wanted to try and do it in India. Uh, they, they're newer in the country, so they're learning. Um, there's, an area, there's one area of this zone where they had managed to get maybe 18 hours supply, something like that. Um, one of the issues there is a very wealthy area. It's right next door to their offices, so they didn't have to travel far. One of the issues was that they started getting just lots and lots of complaints. People are used to this intermittent supply. They're used to leaving water on all the time. The tanks start overflowing, but when you put people on a meter, they're still getting billed for all that water that's just, uh, just pouring into the ground. And then people get these crazy high bills, that, and they're like, where did that, where did that come from? Uh, so they just funny it was causing them too much trouble. People didn't appreciate having 24-7. You know, which was quite a shock to the engineers. They were like, we've done all this work for you, and you, like, you say you, were, you didn't notice the difference. You were fine before. Um, okay, so they've brought, they've brought the hours down now because it, it didn't make any difference. One of the issues they were having was communication. 
with the with the consumers in the area. So you can see here, this is a rare example of uh, a sign that it's not actually been put up and it's in the wrong area, but it says like, this is the work we're doing in your neighborhood. That, that kind of stuff actually doesn't usually happen. So no one knows what's going on. It's the, it's the guys that are digging up the street that then have to deal with residents that are like maybe a bit apprehensive that their pipe network that they've just got right is being dug up again. And you know, maybe the guys doing the work that are outsourced anyway, they don't best know how to sell the project to concerned residents. So th this kind of thing has definitely been an issue. Um, <clears throat> the reason that they wanted 24-7 was because the, the way that um, the companies kind of justify coming in on this stuff, sorry, is uh, through expertise at dealing with kind of advanced not the best word, advanced water systems uh, with sort of continuous pressure. Uh, so in order to improve the system, they need to be able to do hydraulic modeling of the system. Uh, they need to know where all the water is going all the time. And that's just, that's just not possible at the moment uh, because the, the situation on the ground is not like that. You can see from the, these are fairly standard uh, kind of international norms. Uh, there's a the, uh, massive discrepancy between the, the status of the project uh, at the time, it's not on there, but it's a couple of years old, and, um, and what they're aiming for. <coughs> and uh, just one of the issues in doing that is that the, the information people have about what's in the ground, where the water's going, uh, is, is not good, and it takes a long, a long time to find out. Um, Okay, I've mentioned, I mentioned that. So it's, it's difficult for them. It's kind of tricky. It's a cause of tension. They say, I'm doing this job. You know, people get garlanded with shoes. People come to our offices shouting like, it's, you know, it's not, it's not worth it. Um, so it's, it's tricky for them. Uh, again, as I mentioned, they have some communication with politicians, which sometimes makes it difficult. Uh, this, okay, so this is, this is right next to a tube bar. They're just digging up the road. Uh, one of the things people say, several people said, is like just every foot we dig, we find new pipes. Uh, and other people in Maharashtra, they say the same thing. You know, if the water network's been laid three times, you've got three different sets of pipes in the road. Then you've got maybe a tube bar network that's running parallel. Then maybe people have their own networks. They might have done modifications. You know, people with more money, they can get a plumber in to reroute the system to increase their pressure. That happens. Um, so that's very confusing. Just to physically know what's happening uh, takes a long time. And you'll see, pe you know, you'll see people digging up the roads at night to put in a new water thing or to put new sewers in the road. Again, in these unplanned areas where government supply is not there or is not very good, uh, quite often individuals, wealthy households or RWAs will, will take that initiative. The other thing that happens with this is that stuff kind of gets lost underground, like the valves to turn the water on and off to different areas. They get buried and physically lost the there's not a picture in here but that happens and then that, that also breaks the system because you have something turned off that's not meant to be turned off you bring high pressure water in uh, again there's another picture that's not there but you end up getting floods uh, in the road because of this information that's not there quite often that kind of stuff would have been with the Delhi jail board workers previously the, again this kind of personalized individualized information that someone would know that area very well but then if they're not working for the new company they have different work culture whatever that information kind of gets lost and then it takes a long time to recover it uh, they're still working on finding all the inlets to the zone so it's not really clear even where like where all the water is coming from but it's a long project they've got at least 10 years to run um, I guess the, the second major issue is they don't have control of the tube wells. Again, the private operator, that's been just like there's this MLA DJB tanker split. The Delhi Jabot has hung on to the, the tube wells in the area quite um, tenaciously. <sighs> Having said that, I think the, the, the people doing the PPP, they are quite committed to 100% connection in the area, which is not something we've seen from the Jabot before. Um, they just have to figure out a way to get around the government kind of uh, regulations on connecting different areas which is so this kind of looks quite different to thinking about PPP earlier phase of PPPs where tariffs shot up people got disconnected uh, a lot of political opposition this is this is kind of I think that they're trying to think about it a little bit differently uh, and again the tariffs are not set by the operator so they, if you have an, a party in power like the Ahmadmi party that can set tariffs in a way that's kind of pro-poor it means it's not necessarily a, a problem in that way uh, and certainly like in my, in my household where I live, the bills that were running at about 3,000 rupees a month for water came down to 800 after the, the ARP subsidy came in. So uh, for some people it will make a benefit. Um, okay, so kind of zooming out a little bit, lastly, 
Uh, this would be animated, but it's not, so sorry, it's kind of messy to look at. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of abstract representation of spaces of water governance. Um, across the, the bottom half of the chart is kind of more industrialized processes. Top half of the chart is more artisanal, individual, uh, perhaps more old-fashioned processes. This side is, is kind of corporate private sector, that other side is more people controlled. Um, and so what you can probably try and make out is that the, when, water, when reforms to public supply happen, they usually happen in this kind of space uh, involving multinationals, state water, municipal water. Um, but actually there's this whole other area that is, is kind of informalized and reforms don't usually, don't usually take into account. Um, and then again, at the same time, there's this kind of self-provision, individualized supply that also the reforms don't always, don't always touch on. Um, so to, to kind of sum up, um, the, the, the water systems are very uh, pretty uh, fluid. They're, they're kind of leaky, they're porous, uh, they change a lot. They're, um, they're, not, they're not necessarily fixed. Uh, there's, there's a big role for kind of individual mediation and kind of uh, personalized relationships. Definitely there's a role for kind of demographic uh, factors Obviously, gender, class, caste, religion, perhaps. Um, technology is a big deal. It's like this kind of technological arms race of getting bigger pumps, more storage to become more water secure, and that also structures things. Like, so if you know, if you're getting water from a tanker or water from a tube well, that particular choice of supply mode is going to influence um, how your how your water is managed or how you access it in your area. Again, you've got these material factors as well, like the, the type of aquifer that you're on top of, your distance from the, the inlets, all those kind of things. Ah, so uh, broadly, it's, it's complicated. Uh, it's very different from the kind of situation maybe in France or US and bringing those kind of knowledges into, into this situation is a challenge. It doesn't work very well. It needs to be, they need to be rethought or you know, new things from, from here probably need to replace them. Um, that's, that's kind of it. That's me. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for coming and uh, sitting through that. If you, if you have any questions or comments, I would be delighted to hear them. Um, that's it. Thanks very much. I think you mentioned that um, Sarvajal water ATMs, etc. They were not; they hadn't taken off so well. And if you could explain, you mentioned something about the tankers and that water was available for free through the tank. If you could just elaborate a little bit more about why Sarvajal was not working. The second is slightly broader in terms of um, I. You have a certain uh, approach, right? And you had people. You, you know, people you probably are influenced by, referred to, etc. But maybe I missed this in your presentation, but what is your question? Uh, you know, why are you studying? Um, I, mean, I would really like to know what your particular question is. And I know we've had people talk about hydraulic citizenship and all the rest. But one is, what is your question? And then how is it different from existing research? Because uh, this reminds me of Nikhil Anand's research in Bombay. Like, you know, and so in, in, in that sense, what is your entry point, if you will? Okay, um, <coughs> okay sure. Uh, okay, so on the this, on this Sarvajal stuff, um, yeah, you know, it's been it's been a challenge. Uh, it's been a challenge for them. I don't think they've had the kind of uh, kind of sales, the kind of take up that they'd like. Um, the I think they're working at the moment in Bawana and Madapurakada, um, and that, yeah, there have been problems with the ATMs. I mean, the other thing is, 
you know, but but one it does get tanker supply at the moment. People there are uh, don't have this is this is a kind of uh, it's a relocation resettlement site on the northwest edge of of Delhi. Um, so, you know, unemployment's pretty high. People don't have a lot of money to spend. So if if water comes from tankers, which is free, they would rather use that and maybe the tanker comes to the end of their lane they'd rather use that than, than walk to the water ATM and, and pay money to take the water that's what that's what people tell me um, there are other issues around the ATMs uh, you know like I don't know cows come and drink from them and like there's some design issues that maybe need to be worked out um, I mean that's that's that I think they're probably in talks about you know how this situation can be uh, how it can be like rolled out further, maybe, and in other places like uh, you know, ARP is talking about bus stops and things like that. You know, it might be a different, a different kind of setup, uh, train stations, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, there are, you know, there's a few initiatives happening in in that space. Um, Cure the. Uh, Center for Urban and Regional Excellence, they also have a kind of, uh, like that, that small scale uh, RO plant that we saw earlier, they also have a similar thing like that in the area, selling people canned water, which that's pretty cool. So it's kind of like a social enterprise, it's like one of these canned water businesses, but it's, it's run by local people and it's a kind of like no profit, non-profit kind of thing. So the, you know, there's a range of initiatives that I think have just been tried out. People are not happy with the tanker supply, that's for sure. Like again, you know, young girls have to wait at home from school till the tanker comes and stuff like this. So people aren't happy with it. But there's an economic, an economic question there also. I don't know much more than that. Um, yeah, what's different about this work? That's that's a good question. I don't know. Like Nick and Anand's work is great. There's a lot of people that have done really good work here. Um, there, I think there's value in in thinking about these questions in a different site. And I mean, I think the, the main thing that I've not really seen is, um, is groundwater in this stuff. Groundwater seems to be a pretty big gap. Uh, there's, some, there's some great work on Bangalore and groundwater. You know, th there is some in Chennai also. Uh, Nikhil Anand mentions it. It's kind of there, but I think this, this really gives you a different picture. Like, I mean, people would tell me that in, Mom in Bombay, like, they'll send the tankers back. You know, they, they don't want groundwater. They won't take it. And there's not this kind of like, uh, externality to the system that people can just opt out of the system and op opt out of public supply or like if they can't get water they'll do groundwater or people this informal water will come in I, I don't think that happens in the in the same way in other places so that gives a, 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 a different complexion to it uh, the other thing would be that like it's quite unusual to have this this sort of uh, trialing of PPPs different experiments with the water public public water network in one city i mean you know we've heard about nagpur we've heard about hubli darwad uh, bangalore uh, you know people people have studied ppps as well for sure um, but there's this kind of quite unusual situation in delhi that they're uh, they're competing with each other and then on the top of that i mean to be honest on the top of that having the arp come in and try and make changes to the system it's too much change all at once, really. It's like, you know, there would be enough material to do a whole bunch of different, very uh, interesting studies here. Um, so I think there is, there is a lot of stuff in this, this case study that is, is new and we probably haven't seen in other work. I'm still working on it. So, like, you know, maybe I'll be able to take those things out of it later. Hello. Okay. Um, earlier on, you had a frame on there, a picture of um, where there were uh, um, water like connections with uh, PVC piping, right? Yeah. And you made a you made a comment about that, um, but I didn't quite catch it. Can you can you say again? Yeah, right there. What did you say about the plastic? You said something about the plastic pipes. Oops. Yeah. Don't don't comply with the gel board code. So there's this, there's this funny sort of like uh, it's different in different areas again. But there's this funny sort of thing happening where um, <coughs> the gel board is not allowed to give a water connection that is more than 10 meters away from their uh, what do you call it secondary distribution pipe or their, their local distribution pipe. So they're not allowed a long pipe. The pipe should be metal. It should be 10 millimeter. 
diameter, I think, yeah, 10 millimeters of diameter. There's a, there's a various sort of stipulations for um, how Delhi Jailboard connections should be. And, and these don't meet that. Um, and so I think what's, what's happening here is that through some kind of method over time, uh, people have taken connections from the edge of the zone, from, from the jailboard. How that's happened, I'm not quite sure. There are different things. The plumbers come in. Sometimes there are tube wells at the edge that people take. Um, but these, these don't comply. So just in the same way that your unauthorized colonies don't comply with uh, land use zoning, uh, and so it makes it hard to bring infrastructure there. You've got the same thing that the infrastructure doesn't comply with the, uh, the regulations. So that makes it hard for the, the jailboard shouldn't really be involved in it. They have to kind of ignore that these pipes are made of PVC. Uh, so again, that's a problem for the private operator when they're coming in and they're, they're having to retrofit these areas with stuff that complies, but everything in the areas doesn't comply with, it's, a, it's complicated to work out. That's as, as far as I know. Um, in the beginning, you had a map with different uh, areas of Delhi and how much water they get. Yeah, this one. And it's really disturbing to see, for example, Narela up there with 31 and NDMC where all the politicians sit with 462. So I was just wondering in your reading around this, has the ARP tried to address or do they even want to look at inequality within the city and especially the peripheral regions which is which as you must have seen have the more informal settlements migrants coming into the city things like that so people who are disadvantaged already and then they've got this problem of low water access so is the app looking at that or not there are uh geez. yeah i think i think that's kind of it's it's interesting to me i did uh, that there is this, there, there is this kind of imbalance, and and at the same time, there's this very common narrative from the Delhi Jabot of we don't have enough water, we need more water from Haryana, from the canal, we need to build more dams up in the Himalayas. There's not enough water. Um, I mean, the amount of supply that's coming into Delhi on average is is the highest in India. It's, it's higher than New York. It's higher than Buenos Aires. Is uh, Delhi gets a lot of water, but the distribution is is kind of skewed. Um, there. There is a project, Jalwood has a project to try and bring this down. Uh, they're building new reservoirs in, in each of the zones. And the thinking there is that you, the more storage, just like in a house, you would have storage tanks and they will smooth out the intermittent supply over the course of the day. If you can put more storage in these zones, you can try and smooth that across the, the course of a week or, or whatever. Um, that's taken time, it's, it's an ongoing project. And the second thing, I mean, yeah, ARP has, ARP has mentioned it. Like the ARP, the ARP white paper on, on water in Delhi is, is excellent. And definitely like inequitable distribution is, is there for sure. Um, how to actually, to make this happen with perhaps, you know, different interests, different resident groups that live in different areas. That's something I'm super curious about how that, how that will take place. Do you think people care about the inequitable, inequitable distribution of public water, or do you think like they just feel like we'll give the money and we we'll, we should we are we should be entitled because we pay, and so they would want to go th through the informal forms modes of water? Yeah, it's something that is something that sort of puzzles me. I think I think a lot of people might not know. Like when I when I meet people in these kind of more peripheral, marginalised areas, um, it's it would more be something that I would tell them. They wouldn't, uh, you know, bring it up so much. Um, people are definitely very aware that like they there is clean this Sonia Vihar water. Somehow that's become really entrenched in people's mind. Actually, I think there's uh, the PPP project is having a problem because the the amount of bulk water coming in from Sonia Vihar is not enough. So they're not getting enough bulk water for their project. There's this whole, there's a whole other politics around that. Um, yeah, no, pe people probably don't really care, but they would like to get water from somewhere, and they know that if they're getting groundwater, which is 
you know, causing kidney stones, liver abscess, whatever, or is giving people rashes. You know, they don't want that. They don't want to have to wait for tankers. They don't want to shell out so much money on, on these various kind of suboptimal coping strategies. So, like, whether the inequality is something that motivates people or not, you know, I don't know. But the, 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 the scarcity is, is definitely is an issue. <laughs> right, if there aren't uh, any more questions, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Matt, for visiting your work. Yep. And please stay tuned for more from Public Analysis. Thanks.